Yeah. Uh, we um, have two speakers today. Um, clearly, we have uh, John and Larry, and I'll introduce them later. Uh, but briefly, he's the CEO and founder of the West Hoffman Liberation Organization. And I'll say a few more things about him. But we want to start with our first uh, speaker, who will be Kayla Dantini. Uh, he's an honor student. She's going to do a lot presentation, so I'm going to ask her to come up here. Uh, for, uh, uh, you, you feel more comfortable presenting? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. You can present. Um, and so she's read an additional article. Uh, written by uh, a Javanese scholar, an Indonesian Javanese scholar, a young scholar who's conducted research uh, in this pop law. And um, she's looking at some contemporary solutions. Uh, it's sort of a rare sort of uh, art, uh, an Indonesian scholar who takes a very critical uh, perspective uh, on contemporary movement. And, um, and, 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 uh, but I'll leave it to uh, Kayla to, uh, to explain, to discuss the article, and to um, give us some direction in terms of how it connects with yes, Jenny Monroe's Okay, then we'll have some time to ask Kayla a couple questions, and then I'll move to introduce our keynote speaker, John Nari, for today. Um, and he has some slides, I think, that he will share with us uh, for roughly 45 minutes or so. And then we'll ask him some uh, questions. Take some notes if you have some ideas and so forth while uh, we'll be speaking and explaining some of this. So why don't we begin with uh, Kate? Hi, right, yeah. So for my honors opportunity for this course, I read the original paper by. Veronica Bruce Mariotti called Capital Minds Matter. And I want to share it with you all because I feel that it adds a new layer to the ethnography that we've been reading by Monto for the last few weeks. So as we all know, in the last few years in the US, there's been a publicity of the phrase Black Lives Matter, especially in good the hashtag trending on various social media platforms. And although the Black Lives Matter has existed for nearly a decade now, this hashtag became extremely publicized after the news of the going to report. And I'm sure we can all remember how prominent this message was in social media with so many of us posting and interacting with posts surrounding Black Lives Matter. And as individuals living in the U.S., we tend to perceive news and current events from an American lens because it's most central and familiar to us in our lives. But sometimes we can forget how much social media has had such a global impact connecting us and allowing for such an expansive spread of news. So with the heightened publicity of Black Lives Matter on social media, it reached many different areas across the world, specifically in West Papua, where the Papua youth began to publicize the phrase Papua Lives Matter in solidarity and, in solidarity and as well in the common fight to destigmatize Blackness. So in Kusa Mariani, I found that she did an extremely strong job in adding a new global framework to the issues of racism of this first faced by Papua youth in the education system, as described by Monroe, by bridging the similarities between the U.S. and West Papua. In her central argument, she was drawing parallels between racism in America and the West Papua to show that racism isn't limited to a specific country or situation, but rather she argues that the origin of racism often boils down to the stigma surrounding Blackness. And by saying Blackness is stigmatized, both authors provide strong examples of how the promotion of fabricated stigmas can have the consequential global impacts of the perpetuation of racial stereotypes. So in Monroe's paper, she uses a phrase that stereotypes are powerful social nets to show how rumors and stereotypes absolutely have the potential to demand status, position, and belonging to Black individuals, especially in Gina, Papua, Green, Papua, and actively targeted in the education system as we primarily because of the original energy. So to Maria, you took this idea of stereotypes one step further to try and understand why Papua New Guinea resonated so strongly with the rest of the Black Lives Matter, something happening on the completely opposite side of the world. I found Monroe explained it best with the phrase of collective suffering. 
Basically, meaning that the painful racial experiences of black and youth that we have read about is being denied academic opportunities on the basis of their physical appearance and associated stereotypes can be a narrative that many black individuals around the world relate to, regardless of the country that they live in. Even more so, there is the direct parallel to the U.S. individual. In West Papua, who was killed due to an issue of police brutality under the charge of resisting arrest. For me, examining, examining such similar racially fueled incidents in the U.S. and West Papua serves as a critical thought exercise to see how, although origins of racism may be somewhat different based on the development of the nation itself, it shows how different countries can be dealing with the exact same issues surrounding race in completely opposite sides of the world. By reading Monroe's ethnography, where she had the perspective to look understand why racism works within the system, it was eye-opening to see a new global framework that Husso and Mariani provided for the issues faced by the West Papua movement. She highlighted how the movements of hashtag Black Lives Matter and hashtag Papua Lives Matter have ignited one another, essentially fighting for common goals of equity and liberation to completely different political climates, promoting conversation to destigmatize blackness. Overall, Cruz and Mariani created the space to speak about how racial issues faced by Papua and youth that we have been reading about, not isolated in the West Papua region, or issues that we have in the U.S. stay within our nation, but rather there's a global connection within broader contemporary protests around the world, sparking conversations to understand how the stigmatization of blackness is manifested under, white, on, under both white supremacists and within Asian societies. Any questions for Kim? Perhaps you can elaborate on how you uh, were connected to some aspects of my brain's ethnography. She's told us occasionally throughout on and off that um, based on many of the West Papuan experiences um, of living under Indonesian colonial that they have developed this sort of sentiment that they prefer to be um, living separate, right? You know, she comes back to that in chapter seven, talking about their experiences for schooling, or um, how does uh, the article that you read on hashtag lines, how does that sort of uh, uh, deepen our insight and understanding those sort of sentiments at some point? Um, I think because in the paper that I read, it went a lot into kind of like looking at the development like of the nation itself but under like Indonesian rule and stuff. Um, and it kind of goes back to like how although like under Indonesian rule, it's kind of presented that many like Papua New have or are presented the same like opportunities within the education system and within the government itself um because of just discrimination and um, prejudice and stuff i feel that they aren't like presented with the same opportunities um which kind of leads to a lot of discourse surrounding um just kind of wanting to be separate from like the Indonesian world Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, thanks for giving us a target. Today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, <clears throat> John Kamari. Uh, he was educated in Indonesia, um, in elementary schools, right on top of the theory. University level education. Uh, he's a graduate. He made uh, if you ask some questions, talk about uh, experiences of going to colleges and universities, right? As a as a pop one. Um, but he graduated and he was working for British Petroleum, for the BP, uh, as a um, as a technician, as a professional employee for several years. But during that time, he also began to work and to organize uh, pop ones to try to um, 
to get Merdeka, as they say in, in the new film. Opulence used that word Merdeka, uh, referring to independence, uh, to their, uh, freedom, regaining their sovereignty. And so, as an organizer, um, he began to bring together uh, Opulence. He worked on and off with some Indonesian supporters of Opulence uh, independence. Um, but he caught the eye and the attention of Indonesian intelligence. And so the intelligence agents were following him. Um, and he was aware that there's been a pattern over the last couple of decades of Indonesian intelligence working to eliminate the new generation of leaders. Um, so uh, he found a way to, uh, to escape uh, Indonesia and those sort of dangers. And he was able to uh, obtain uh, residence uh, and official legal status in the U.S., where he's been living in exile for over a decade. Um, living here, he's continued to organize. He's still the leader of the World um, Liberation Organization, um, you know, based in uh, Indonesia. So he's a leader in exile. Now, and he's been playing an important role of working to. Uh, appeal to the U.S. government and to the United Nations, uh, the General Assembly, and other committees in the U.N. to reverse the decision of the of turning over West Papua to Indonesian uh, colonial control in the early 1960s. Uh, so he update us. He may be doing some things in the U.N. next year that perhaps some of us can also participate uh, in. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, John Narendra. Thank you so much for everyone and the student for and then and then the Hofstra University and then Professor Timothy and uh, and others, uh, I thank you so much. Uh, can you hear my voice clear? Okay, yeah, I'm trying to adjust the sound. The, um, the mic, you may want to adjust yours as well. Yeah, but, uh, but keep talking. I think we can work out the stage. Oh, okay, okay. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for everybody. Uh, I am uh, John Anari. I am from uh, West Papua. Yeah, like uh, Officer I think has uh, explained before. Uh, I am the founder of uh, West Papua Liberation Organization. Yeah, why I create this organization. Yeah, because the situation in my island uh, and because the occupation by colonialists is no good. Uh, make uh, every people uh, suffering, uh, like in my island too. And that's why better we fight for our rights and our ancestral land. If we keep silent, follow them, nothing we can get. They are greedy and deception. Uh, so today, I want to explain how uh, West Papua joined with Indonesia because of the mining. This mining make our land can join with Indonesia. Excuse me, John. I think it may be your two microphones. I think it's uh, if you move back a little bit, you speak lower. It seems like it's here. Sorry. Here. See if you can turn one of your mics. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, there's still some static. I think it's two of your mics that are causing some of the static, the sound. So you can adjust that or maybe your headphone mics. 
So like this, you can hear more clear or? Yeah, it's still it's still static, it's more static. So maybe without the you know the headphone bike, if, if we have a bike that's in there, maybe we turn one of those off. Oh come like Like this? Yes, that's much better. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Turn your mic back. Turn this back. Okay, I don't use the headset. Huh? Yeah, thank you so much for everybody. And I'm glad to see you again. And then thanks for Professor Tim to give me the opportunity to teach the student about uh, my island of West Papua. Yeah. I, today, I want to explain how West Papua can join with Indonesia because of the mining. The mining conspiracy make my island can join with Indonesia because uh, we, we have uh, biggest gold mining in the world and the third uh, copper mining in the world After, because of that not only uh, copper and gold but uh, according to the uh, exploration by that uh, geologist in 1936 uh, they in in his explain explanations, he said uh, more than one hundred uh, metals. The metals they can make everything, or make an airplane, make car, make phone, make TV, laptop, and everything. So today, I want explain uh, for this. To the students so we can uh, look together so uh, this is yeah this is uh, i give the title uh, mining conspiracy in west papua so, from cuba to west papua mining because after this mining and take over in Cuba, so they lose. They they just invest over there maybe three billion, and they just first uh, export, well, and then they lose because uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara take over the president of Batista, so Freeport in Cuba lose, and then they lose three billion. So that's why. They looking for another place, and then they have uh, data in our island because they have doing exploration before, since uh, nineteen thirty three to nineteen thirty six. So next, uh, I want to continue. Yeah, this is. Uh, West Papua, West Papua, before uh, occupied by Netherlands, uh, occupied West Papua and German occupied uh, New Guinea and British occupied Papua. But after uh, World War One, um, British win in World War One, so they occupied New Guinea territory that's uh, occupied by Germany. And then after the uh, Second World War, they preparing independent as Papua New Guinea country today. And our island, uh, after World War II, preparing independent as West Papua. After that, 
occupied by Indonesia. So West Papua is a, a territory in the South Pacific Island, in the northern of uh, Australia, and in the east, eastern part of uh, Indonesia also. And the, the, the New Guinea, uh, why New Guinea reads? Because of the uh, tectonic plate between uh, Caroline uh, Plate, the, the Pacific Caroline, and then the, the uh, Sahul Plate make uh, the island of New Guinea. So New Guinea uh, uh, clash between the two plates, so make so many mountains over there, so make this uh, island very rich with uh, natural resources. So oil, gas, mining, also so many over there. This is same like a Pacific plate clash with the American North American continent in the California to Seattle. So that's why over there, uh, so many uh, mineral resources over there. Uh, also in the South America, clash with the Pacific Plate make the the mountain in the Chile. Uh, I forget the name of the mountain. Mm -hmm. It's the same with the tectonic plate with between uh, India Plate with uh, Asia Plate make the Himalaya mountain. So so many mineral resources also over there. So in this world, the area between the collision of the plate make the island and the territory very rich with natural resources. So this is same like in Papua, same with the New Guinea. Yeah, this is the mining in West Papua. So this is now they take the mining here. This is from satellite map. I took the picture. Uh, this is a Freeport McMoran mining here. This the headquarter of uh, Freeport in Arizona. So and then this I saw the picture from the satellite. Mm -hmm. And this is the Grassberg mining. They make big hole. Before is the mountain, but they clean up. And then the second is the small one here. They call a uh, Erzberg mountain. So Erzberg and Grassberg now they clean up. And now they make underground mining uh, around this area too. Because of the volcanic uh, eruption million years ago. So, so many metals underground also. So they drill and make uh, all to take the mining underground. So this mining, um, the, the diameter uh, of this hole more than three miles and then the deepest inside down to more than uh, two miles for the grass bag. And then ash bag also, uh, I don't count. So this mining is make a problem mm -hmm. to our people. So the, the mining, they can produce uh, like copper, they make a penny, this for in, in US, they make penny because to Freeport took copper from Papua and then they make penny in US. And then they make a copper wire and then the gold, they make a ring, necklace, everything. And then they make the chips in processor for computer and then they make a nickel, they make a penny also, this like a 10 cent, one, and then, um, yeah, this a nickel and then also nickel, they make a lithium battery and then uranium they took for make uh, nuclear weapons in here and then um, 
titanium they use for make a tank like here and then another they used to make a gun make a airplane make ship car and everything satellite well, this is the function of the mining so this is the grassberg and Erzberg mine in Papua and this is the grassberg open pit here and then this is also grassberg and then Erzberg is the small one bottom before Erzberg here this is the mountain here they took picture by airplane since uh, 1933 by uh, Chevron uh, engineer uh, by standard oil vacuum engineer he found this mountain he took the picture by airplane so now this they make hole here this is Erzberg and then this is Grasberg so this is the mine open pit here from grass back and then underground this they, they, they have a, a reserve underground this they call a grass back block cave and then coaching lear and big gosan and those and their males and then this is they have this still uh, make the biggest underground mining in the world today in Papua. And the history before is uh, well, how the geologists from Netherlands, New Guinea Petroleum Company, or in Netherlands, they call Netherlands, New Guinea Petroleum Maskapai. This is the base in, in Sorong, in, in West Papua. And then this, this uh, geologist they doing the exploration in 1990. 33 to 1936 so they, they they found the mining and then the this oil company uh, the oil company uh, owner by standard vacuum oil company and bpm is a ne netherlands uh, company before so they have a uh, 40 percent and then standard Vacuum Oil Company, 40%, and Pacific Investment, uh, uh, or Standard Oil of California, 20%. Standard Oil California now chain uh, with uh, Chevron, and then uh, Standard Oil Vacuum uh, join with uh, join with a uh, Standard Oil Company in New York and Standard Oil New Jersey. Then. Now today make a Exxon Mobil. So now Chevron also operate in Southern Papua. They still doing an exploration today. And then also BP. BP now today has a, they produce the gas and then send to China, send to Korea and send to Mexico. So this is the geology who who doing mapping in the Grassbeck and Ashbeck Mountain uh, since uh, 1933 to 1936. His name is Hans Karl St Yeah, uh, He's he worked as in the Royal Dutch uh, exploration, special in New Guinea. So he he doing the photographers from the mountain and from the airplane this why he he found he found the mining the this mountain and then finally they send the geologist from uh, they call a NNGPM Netherlands New Guinea Petrol Maskapai they doing uh, exploration in 1936 so this is they doing the exploration and by that uh, geologist, his name is Chen uh, Jekoe Dosis. So he doing research in 1936. And then this is him and he's here. 
And then this is his map. He found the Ersberg here and then Gressberg here. He, this is uh, his map in 1936. And then after that, and then he still keep this. That's it. And then the Japanese come, coming, came, and then occupied the Bibini also in the northern part. So Japanese occupied in the north, and then the British and Dutch, they moved to the south of New Guinea. And because in the northern uh, New Guinea, Japanese occupied. So under uh, General Douglas MacArthur, they joined force and then kicked them, uh, kicked British, uh, uh, Japanese out. And then they transfer uh, the territory back to Netherlands for back to occupy the West Papua and then in the East Papua and left for British. So US uh, Army go back to US and then let the Japan let, let Netherlands and British and then they established the United Nations in 24 October so for process uh, decolonization uh, because for non-self-governing territory around the world so that's and Netherlands British come back to, to New Guinea and then they preparing independent for West Papua and, and Papua New Guinea today but after preparation, and then we will see. Yeah. So this is the mining in Cuba. Freeport in Cuba lost after Fidel Castro and Che Guevara take over. So in 1959, Freeport collapsed in Cuba after Fidel Castro and Che Guevara take over. Batista, who uh, because he, he was supported by capitalism. And then Freeport Mining in, in Moor Bay uh, took over. So finally, they trying to take their data in 1936 for Grassbeck and Ashbeck Mountain because they have uh, data. So they, in 19... Uh, in August 1959, Freeport director uh, Forbes Wilson, he used the red helm, helmet here. Yeah. He met with uh, John von Kusen, the director of the, the Dutch company in Indonesia. Uh, also, this is the mining company in Indonesia. Uh, he made them to doing the uh, joint exploration for the to the uh, Ersberg. They, they call here Ersberg, but they call go to Ersberg and Grassberg. So they doing the uh, join a, a statement, uh, the meeting, and for doing the exploration. So uh, Forbes Wilson, he report to New York, Freeport Headquarters in New York to, for f financing them to go for exploration. So the contract was signed in February 1st, 1960. And then in May until July 1960, Forbes Wilson came to West Papua and then doing the exploration in Grasberg and Ersberg. So, and then he report to Bob Hills uh, as the president of Freeport in New York City. So this is the picture of the uh, Freeport mine in Moor Bay. And then this is Forbes Wilson in the, <clears throat> in, uh, in West Papua in 1950. So Rockefeller interest in Indonesia. 
the two uh, the oil uh, standards standard oil uh, of New Jersey or and then standard oil of California and Texaco is the owner is uh, John David Rockefeller and Freeport Sulfur in Indonesian also the board is a Rockefeller family and Alice and then they put uh, August uh, C. Long as the board member in Indonesia also. He's the chairman of Texaco for many years. And then he also uh, joined with them to help Rockefeller business in Papua. And then finally in John F. Kennedy inauguration, and then they use him and after inauguration of the U.S. President John F. Kennedy in 20 January 1961 and 20 January, U.S. Ambassador in Indonesia, his name is uh, Howard Boy Jones, and sent the cable to U.S. President John F. Kennedy for West New Guinea must be part of Indonesia, so Indonesia will deleting uh, their uh, communist party in indonesia because of papua indonesia make the country to the communist so this is a uh, hot by jones asking john kennedy uh, to push that to give uh, west papua to indonesia so also in april 2nd april 1961, John Kennedy sent the letter to Prime Minister uh, John Edward de Quay to accept the diplomat, uh, Mr. Esholt Bunker, proposal, and let the and he said in the, his letter he said, uh, let uh, stone people of New Guinea let join them with Indonesia. So this is uh, also Bunker acting as a UN Secretary General Mediator, and he was appointed by UN Secretary General Yutan. And then, before Yutan, the, the UN Secretary General, uh, Doug Hamas Jol, he's planning with that for granted independence in 1960 because uh, UN uh, General Assembly has set up the resolution uh, 1514 in 1960 for granted independence. That's why that's preparing uh, in 1961, that's preparing independence. So pre preparing our council and political party council and then the council has a meeting and then establish our national anthem, our flag, and everything. And then in September, they planning uh, uh, planning to register West Papua as the UN membership. But this guy unlucky, and then he was killed because he's planning to give the independent for our, uh, for West Papua also. So they kill him in 18 September. 1961, before eight days before the UN session, for accept uh, West Papua as a UN membership, according to the eyewitness, uh, Saxele Mulega, saw the jet fighter follow back, and then shoot down his airplane. And then, also, the son of uh, the governor of New York. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, his son is uh, Michael Rockefeller. Uh, written like lost in New Guinea. When, when I watched the video of uh, interview, he, the, another people join with him. He, they say their uh, gas, gasoline uh, empty. So he jump and then swim to the, uh, from the boat, uh, swim from the rivers in the asthma, so, and then he lost. And then another just stayed, and then 
they come and then help them. And then Rockefeller laughs. Why he jump and then swim? This make a question. So, and then finally Nelson Rockefeller, he said, Nelson, uh, well, brother is a deaf Rockefeller also. That, um, and, and, a grandson of a deaf Rockefeller. And then Rockefeller uh, disappeared in New Guinea in 19 November 1961. So Netherlands still continue for preparing for decolonization courses. So they granted independence for West Papua according to the UN uh, Resolution 1514. So Netherlands uh, set up the council. This is our picture, the picture of the council member. And then in 19 October 1961, they established our national flag, our coat of arms, and our national anthem. And then they asking the Netherlands for the permission for rise up our flag, they call it Morning Star flag. And then finally in 1 December, around all Papua rise up our flag. And then we have declared our independence in 1 December 1961. And then this is the picture, so many pictures in 1 December in every city and every city around the Papua. So they rise up like this in Manokwari, and this is in Merauke, and this is in Hollandia. Yes. And then this is the council. And this is uh, Marcus Kaisepo. So the flag to the governor of uh, Netherlands and of governor of Netherlands again. And that we are ready to independent. And then after independent and Indonesian unhappy, so they send their military to occupy West Papua in after independent in one December nineteen sixty one and then in nineteen December nineteen sixty one Indonesian send their military to occupy. And then this is one guy like this, the Police capture one Indonesian infiltrant here. And then this is the Indonesian volunteer corps, the lady here. And then another, this they still uh, rec rec uh, hire rec volunteer to fight in, in New Guinea. And then they come and then they put pamphlet in the village like, Welcome Indonesia. So that's thinking maybe they say, Indigenous Papuan put the pamphlet, but no, this is Indonesian. Um, and then this is the thing. Uh, the in U.S. send the Mustang for Indonesian to fight in to invasion, military invasion in West Papua also. The U.S. support Indonesian also. So. West Papua Army and police and the civil also they join for fighting against the Indonesian occupation. So this is our army. This is, and this is our police join. And then this is Air Force and Navy. And then they join to fight against the Indonesian. And, and also Papuan people also protest demonstration everywhere, everywhere against the Indonesian occupation and ambition to occupy the West Papua. So our people protest every, around the city in Papua. And finally, U.S. President uh, John F. Kennedy and U.N. Secretary General Utan, they push that for negotiate with Indonesian and the meeting in the Virginia in Middleburg on 24 May 1962. 
And then finally, they accept the proposal of Elsop Banker. The proposal of, of, of Elsop Banker, they know as a New York Agreement and Rome Agreement. The New York Agreement was signed by Indonesia and Netherlands in the UN Security Council room in New York City. And then in, on, on 15 August 1962, a Rome Agreement was signed by Indonesia and Netherlands in Italy on September 13, 1962. The, the New York Agreement uh, contained uh, by arranged by transfer administration and self-determination or referendum. But uh, Rome Agreement arranged about the referendum must be doing uh, by consultation system, not uh, doing by uh, all people must come and vote. And then, but Indonesian must control was power only 25 years only. So since uh, Indonesian must come and occupy West Papua on 1st May 1963 to 1st May 1988, but until today, they, they forget the Rome Agreement and they still want to occupy it and colonize. So this is the picture of the signature of uh, New York Agreement in the UN Security Council building on 15 August 1962 and they signed by Kingdom of Netherlands and Republic of Indonesia in UN headquarters in New York. And this, the New York Agreement contained about the transfer of administration of West Papua to the United Nations. They call a United Nations Temporary Executive Authority in October 1st, 1962, then transfer to the Republic of Indonesia uh, in 1st May 1963, and then must doing the self-determination in 1969. And you, the New York Agreement accepted by UN General Assembly Resolution 1752. And finally, they transferred the administration in 1 October 1952 from United Nations to yeah, from that to United Nations and then 1 May 1963 transfer from United Nations Temporary Executive Authority give back to Indonesia so this is the picture of of the UN transfer the administration to Indonesia and then our people protest why what happened when UN come also my people protest UN but they don't care with our people and then this is the our people in the front of our council, and then they they confuse what happened with our life. And finally, Indonesia signed the agreement with the Freeport in Indonesia. After Foreign Minister uh, Indonesian, uh, Mr. Adam Malik met David Rockefeller in Switzerland in April 1967. Then they signed the contract uh, agreement with the uh, Indonesian government in August 19. Uh, oh, I'm wrong. This uh, They signed the agreement in 1967 before the referendum. This I, I'm wrong. Right. They signed the agreement in August 1967 before the referendum in 1969. So Indonesian make sure Freeport to support Indonesian in the United Nations vote about the referendum in the future in West Pop because uh, the referendum will not doing according to the UN Charter Article 73. For every inhabitant must vote, uh, but the real uh, only uh, six hundred and twenty-five settler Indonesian fought in the referendum for join with Indonesia and reject independence, and for hundreds indigenous people uh, who was chosen by Indonesian military also to vote, and then 
800,000 people not fought in the referendum. Finally, they protest. But UN does not hear uh, our people's voice. They don't care with us. So this is the, the situation in the referendum. This is a UN send his uh, representative, Mr. Ortiz San Fernando. He's here, he come to monitoring the referendum. And then he, he said, he proposed to Indonesia must doing the referendum. The people near the beach must, all of them come to, uh, to vote. Only in the mountain, maybe they can use representative <laughs> only. But uh, Indonesia not accept his uh, proposal. And then he reported to the United Nations about the situation of the referendum also. In the United Nations also, the UN Secretary General, Mr. Yutan and everything, the President of the General Assembly also, they don't care, they don't hear his report. And then this is the situation in the referendum. They put them in the dormitory, in the military base, and then they come, they fall. And then this cook in the front is an Indonesian lady here. And then another outside, the, who come protest and then the police and the army come and intelligent, they pick up them and then put them in jail. And then finally the referendum was fought in the UN and accepted by, in 19 of, uh, November 1969, UN fought the referendum and the General President General Assembly established resolution 2504 for the referendum, the fake referendum. So, and then now Indonesia let the Freeport mining come and make the whole, and after the fake referendum win by Indonesia, then Freeport start their business in Grasbeck and Ersbeck Mountain, start in 1976 until today. And then forest degradation and the environment also damage, but they don't care. And our people protest now, and then we make the political wing, and then we use a people power for protest, political wing for diplomacy in the United Nations and around the world, and then political people power in our island join to protest until today protest was in indonesian they use military and then kill and kidnap the people who join to protest in indonesian until today and they put them in jail and then we set up the military wing now they fighting in the guerrilla warfare and then this is like today now they capture one pilot uh, of new zealand and then bring them to the hosted. They, this hosted bring them to the jungle forest of New Guinea. And now we still continue to fight. And we, we never give up to fight. So that's uh, my introduction. And thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to open for some uh, Q&A now. Some questions from the students in the class. So we want to get to this starting. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, so at this time, who knows what a lot of people are I saw um, a couple of them in the so I was just wondering about that aspect. Did, did you hear that, John? <laughs> cannot can you uh, explain again um she she asked a question about the military she needs some images uh contemporary images of opulence in military guard he wants asking you to explain a bit more about the the military dimension of the opulence struggle for independence yeah we sh the military is still doing guerrilla warfare now 
And then the, the military fight on the island, and then we are the political for lobby and diplomacy. And like me, I go to United Nations for speaking in the United Nations, and then we try to lobby the another country, and then also like uh, US, yeah, we explain this case how Indonesia occupied our land. If we, we don't use the military, nobody hear our voice. Because, you know, United Nations too much play the game. That's why today our people using the military to fight. Not only the people power for protest, but we use military also. And then the military fighting in the jungle forest of New Guinea is like you go to Amazon because New Guinea is the uh, the third uh, largest forest in the world after uh, Amazon, the first one, and the second in Congo, and the third is New Guinea. So our soldier, our uh, military, uh, control the, they, they can live in the jungle forest of New Guinea, but Indonesian army, they scared to enter. So they just use drone, put the bomb, go around, look, and then they throw the bomb for the civilian, and then they use helicopter, and then, and then they, drop the bomb to the civilian house, they, they say, oh, they, they say, uh, West Papua Army. They, but that's not a uh, West Papua Army member. They just kill a civilian. And then finally today, so many civilian of Papua exodus because they cannot uh, stay in the, their village because if Indonesia come to the village, they hit, kill everybody. They, they don't care. Because uh, in our uh, land also, Indonesian, they block the uh, internet, they block uh, international uh, journalists came to our land. Mm -hmm. That's why our, the civilian people get out and they're now living in the jungle also. Because they scare with Indonesian uh, army, they crazy. They just come to the village only. They they scared to enter to the jungle forest. So in the jungle forest, our soldiers win in our jungle. So today, our army fight and military fight, a military fight, political fight, and people power fight. So we use three way to get our back our independent so that is why our military is still running today okay, thank you thank you for that was there any follow-up uh, that you want to follow up uh gap here you don't want to follow up with my hands maybe related to that because we've been reading uh jenny monroe's ethnography and as you know she spent a lot of time in the highland areas in Wamena with the Ghani, uh, the Lani and yali uh, groups of indigenous populace uh, and from what i understand there's been uh, an intensification of the armed conflict in the highlands can you give us uh, an update on that. Uh, can you give us an update on the, the fighting, the conflict in the highland areas of West Papua in and around Wamena? Sorry? Uh, John, can you hear me? It's slow. I cannot. Can you explain again? 
Okay. Um, I was wondering if you can give us an update on the, the fighting, the armed conflict in the highland areas uh, around Wamena. Oh, yeah. Now in the highland, Papua, the, because our military uh, military wings uh, fighting in the highland make uh, so many people get out from the highland going so much uh, so many people running to the jungle forest because uh, they cannot uh, come to the near the beach because too far away and then they cannot use uh, Indonesian uh, airplane to come to the near the beach and then there is a uh, uh, no way no road from the headland to the ocean near the beach because uh, New Guinea topography is uh, difficult not like a uh, US here because so many storm and then difficult to make a road also. With so many stone and mountain, that's why difficult. So they just living in the forest. They escape, they running and for escape. And then another of them running to Papua New Guinea country is better. They go by forest, cross the border and they go to Papua New Guinea, because in Papua New Guinea they can live there very well. So now today Indonesian send thousand troops, intelligence, they come to Papua, and then so the intelligence around everywhere in Papua, and then they monitoring every tourism come to Papua also. I think related to that, can you hear me better now? I think this, yeah. this mic was off. Yeah, I think that was probably um, sort of related to perhaps the sentiment of uh, the student's question, of Gabby's question. Um, I think we're accustomed in American society to sort of uh, emphasizing dialogue and um, you know discussion, and perhaps also a nonviolent civil rights movements, right? We've had a history of that, as we talked about Black Lives Matter uh, and, and so forth in the earlier presentation. I think part of the feeling, and, and you know, Gabby, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, uh, that the student expressed was that why not use some nonviolent methods of just emphasizing the protest component and trying to, um, you know, to appeal to the Indonesian government mm -hmm as well as the international community in a nonviolent way. Um, what, you know, what, what do you think about that as an option or why did your movement sort of um, go in another direction? Yes, um, we hope so like that, but we tried to asking Indonesian for dialogue, but they never want for dialogue with us. So we try to speaking also in the United Nations. So many times I come here and speaking in the United Nations and then the United Nations also keep silent until today. That's why whether we use military. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's another question, Hello. Evan. Uh, Mr. Wright, everybody. I was wondering, is he looking uh, at the moment just to find like peace in the country and find a way to co habit habit co live with Indonesians, or does he want complete liberation? Well, hello, hello. Um, you're, I mean, you're welcome to come up here and use this mic, um, or repeat it. And I can I can repeat you. Is he looking to just find? You know, peace at the moment and just find a way to coexist or does he want complete liberation of the country from the Indonesians right now like what is his primary goal at the moment 
Were you able to hear that, uh, John? Uh, um, okay. Yeah, the student raised a question about what's your uh, main goal right now? Are you trying to find a way for peaceful coexistence with the Indonesian government or do you want uh, complete separation and liberation? What, what's the main sort of focus of the, uh, of the West Papua Liberation Organization? Yeah, we we just want Indonesia to get out from our land. We don't want them. So we try to get our uh, aim by three ways, political, for diplomacy and dialogue, and uh, people power, movement, for protests, and then we use the army. So we just want Indonesian get out from our land. So that's uh, our aim for liberation. If we use only one way, maybe difficult. So we use three ways. We use a political wing, and then people power wings, and then military wings. So our aim is just one get Indonesian get out from our land. Because we have country before, we have a independent. We have police, we have army, we have a council, political party, national anthem, and everything. But Indonesian crazy, they they, they want our land only. So they, they crazy, they make the country to be communist. So US is scared. And then finally, US push Netherlands to transfer our land to Indonesia. Because in 1960, US uh, Lost in Vietnam War, so U.S. care uh, Indonesian also will be change the country to the communist. So the, finally, U.S. Uh, under President John F. Kennedy pushed Netherlands to transfer the administration to Indonesian. Uh, that's why today we try to speak back in the U.S. Congress for responsibility. Why John F. Kennedy? Uh, Scare with Indonesian communists and push our dads to transfer our country to Indonesia. And then, yeah, we hope uh, U.S. Congress will help us because U.S. today, they have uh, established, uh, they have uh, established the bill for West Papua. Yeah. The bill, uh, uh, it's our number uh, 26, uh, or one. So I hope this bill uh, can help uh, West Pau. So foreign minister and defense minister of the US will help uh, our struggle. So maybe can by peace solution with the with, with this bill of US Congress. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you for that. Let's um, move on to some other questions as well. Just feel free to say it from your seat. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it, or you can come up front. Perhaps you can give us some more explanation of at least some of your perspectives on the relationship of um, the you know, uh, the economics, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot in my class about neoliberal capitalism. And in your slides, you gave us a lot of details about the sort of the economic um, value of, of Papua, right? the, the riches in all of these resources. You detail these global capitalist corporations, oil companies, gas companies, and so forth coming in. Um, can you explain a bit the relationship between these corporations and the Indonesian state? Do they have what kind of contracts and agreements? Uh, and give us a sense of the economic stakes of uh, the continuation of maintenance of the colonization of Papua. Yeah, the politic and economy always uh, together. 
Yeah. The, the first is economic. The economic is uh, very important. That's why they're using politics. So today, Indonesia, the economic will stab, uh, stabil because of the gold reserve from Papua, they took from Papua. So the currency will stabil. If not, maybe inflation, like before in 1960, 1950 until 1960, Indonesian, the country so many inflation. That's why they need the power for the gold. So make the reserve of Indonesian uh, economic will stabilize. And also like today, BP, uh, British Petroleum. I, I worked with BP before, before I came here. So BP today uh, give uh, tax for Indonesian every year is more, more than uh, 1,000 uh, uh, million for Indonesian government. And for Papuan people, nothing. And also the Papuan people, uh, especially for uh, as we, uh, the, the indigenous people over there near the my, uh, the BP, uh, they don't have uh, shareholder. The shareholder is mm -hmm. from BP, and then with the uh, with the Japanese uh, uh, Nippon oil ex explore Nippon oil exploration uh, with uh, BP. And then with uh, another uh, businessman from Indonesia, so they have a shareholder. The Papuan government, they don't have nothing. And then they just come and then, oh, we, we, we take your oil, gas, and then we, we can build you. It's a bullshit, higher. And then so many, and, and today uh, also like a free port. Report now they they make a smelting in Indonesia. The Indonesian president asked Freeport must make a smelting for separate the ore from gold, copper, silver, uranium, plutonium, titanium, and everything they make the smelter. They make in Indonesian area. Why they don't make in Papua? And then they just bring the ore from Papua bring to Indonesia and then they separate over there. And then now the Indonesian government, they protect to send, not send the material of all go, uh, 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 not export uh, material outside, but must separate before in Indonesia and then export. So they, they will separate the material from copper, gold, silver, and everything in Indonesia and then how much uh, they need, they can sell and then they can uh, lucky for the, uh, their economic. And then and today the province, uh, the poorest province in Indonesia is West Papua. West Papua province, very poorest in Indonesia, but the, the income tax from the government of Indonesia 70% is coming from Papua natural resources. Not only mining, not only oil and gas, but we have uh, oil palm, and then for the food industry, the industry also they make in Papua more than 2 million acres. They take down and then for the food energy. And then they they break down our forests, and then our people before they can live, they can hunt them for their life. Now they must work with them, so they they pay them, and then they cannot uh, live like before. Like they go hunting, they don't care 
they can hunting, they can make garden or whatever. But now Indonesia break down the forest. And now Indonesia make the forest degradation. And today, they, according to the Copenhagen uh, agreement uh, by United Nations, they push the country, make the carbon dioxide, must pay the country who have the forest. So today, the country, three countries have the forest in the world is uh, Brazil, uh, Congo, and Indonesia. Indonesia is uh, from Papua and Kalimantan. They still have well, Kalimantan. They have cleaned up the forest only now in Papua because still far away from Indonesia. So difficult to them for them to clean up. But they, they have cleaned up so many. And then like uh, last year ago, uh, last month ago, um, Indonesian get the in, in uh, the Norway country pay Indonesian to keep the forest. Uh, they pay them uh, eight hundred million US dollar, and then they give for the country for Indonesia, not for our people. And the the money well coming for Indonesian president and finance minister only. They don't give for our country our people to keep our forest. And then they still clean up the forest and forest degradation now, now make a global warming now. And so many islands in the Pacific Ocean now going down, like in Tonga, Micronesia. On, on that note, how would things improve if your organization and, and West Papuans achieve sovereignty? How What would your policies be for sustainable development, right? That's a major focus now in the United Nations. How would things be improved and detailed a lot of the environmental destruction under the colonial system along with global capitalism? How would that change under independent rule um, led by uh, the West Papua Liberation Organization? The sustainable development is uh, they just say it, but cannot uh, our people maybe we wait for the program of sustainable development maybe our people will be same with the indian people in us and then aboriginal people in australia they will clean up us so our people we don't want to wait for the sustainable development we need we life and standing by ourselves so we can uh, follow the program of the sustainable development that's why last year i tell to the united nations president general assembly i said the sustainable development will not running well for the uh, territory that occupied by uh, colonialists like uh, West Papua and then also they make a fake referendum for us to join with Indonesia. That's the problem. And then the agenda of sustainable uh, development will not running well in my life. If we independent, okay, maybe we can run it well. <laughs> well, just briefly, because we're just about out of time, can you uh, give us some idea of what we can do to support the Papuan struggle for independence? Oh, yes. Uh, I hope maybe next year I can bring some students join with me in the United Nations. And what will that take place? That's going to be the UN General Assembly meeting or the Forum on Indi Indigenous Peoples? Yeah, for Indigenous people also and UN General Assembly also. Maybe I hope one day the student can join with me to come to the UN uh, headquarters in Manhattan. Okay, let's stay in touch and keep us posted on those dates and I'll let students uh, know about it. Thank you very much, uh, John and Ari. Thank you so much, everybody.